Stories span from a quaint New England inn to a farm in the mountains of Oregon, where poltergeists captivate witnesses with noisy disturbances and physical activity. Patrons of a country music bar in Kentucky wonder if poltergeists are malevolent forces influenced by murder. While a scientist refuses to let fear stand between him and the true origins of poltergeist activity, perhaps there are earthly explanations for poltergeist events. But to those who have witnessed these unnerving phenomena, they remain strange, sometimes terrifying, and completely unexplained. John Stone's Inn lies in the countryside village of Ashland, Massachusetts, 30 miles southwest of Boston. It appears to be home to poltergeists, noises and movements that some think are caused by ghosts. It was here in March of 1976 that Robin Hicks' view of the world changed forever. The inn's attic used to contain apartments where Robin spent nights with his wife. On this night, they heard strange noises. And it was a, a little girl bouncing a ball. La, 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 Down the hall. And I ran out the door and down the stairs and all around the building and checked every door and it was closed. A couple of days later, a friend of mine who was walking by said, did you have, is your niece here the other night? And I said, no, why? He said, well, I saw a little girl looking out your window. Robbins was not the only account of the mysterious appearance of a little girl. They used to talk about the little girl who danced. And you'd come in in the morning, and it's an old building. So you'd hear things, and you'd think, you know, it's creaking. I mean, normally that's what you would think. Well, this one day, it wasn't creaking. I don't think so. It was like really tip, 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 like that. You'd listen, and you'd say, what is that? I guess it was a little girl dancing upstairs. The inn's owner at the time was beginning renovations. He noticed that doors, locked the night before, were found open the next morning. And lights, turned off, were later seen blazing in the dark. His staff was also encountering strange forces. One night after a busy night, all the waitresses were sitting around a table, and I was with them, and they were counting their tips and uh, getting ready to go home. And the floors in the in the end, creak quite readily, especially when it's real quiet. Um, you can hear it, and so when someone walks by you, you can hear the creak and you get a little breeze that goes by, and uh, we had that experience, but there was no one else in the restaurant but us, and uh, they quickly gathered up their money and, and left that night. The staff at John Stone's Inn began sharing their eerie stories of portentous encounters. My car was parked over there where that truck is parked. And I walked this way and I glanced back up at the building just to see if there was anybody around. And I looked up at the window on the left hand side and I saw that greenish white ball of light. And I went over to my car and then drove up here, got out and glanced back up at the window, saw the light again, and then the light disappeared and the room was dark. Some staff members claim to have had startling physical encounters with the spirit. Kitchen workers were relaxing one night when an unseen force startled them by levitating a pack of cigarettes and propelling it across the table. Similar stories of playful poltergeists began to flourish. Stories of lively forces mischievously pushing waitstaff in the basement. Of the sounds of footsteps of extinguished candles inexplicably relighting, and of the incessant strange apparitions. We would always close off this one particular room at one point in the night, and in that room I saw something go by the window. And it wasn't um, blurry or fuzzy or sheer as you would imagine a ghost to be. So I flung open the door and I said, to what I thought would be a human. Hey, what are you still doing in? And before I could finish my sentence, I noticed there was nobody in there. And unfortunately, I spun on my heel and got out of the room rather than enter it, because I know it's a friendly ghost. Not everyone would assume that the ghosts here were friendly. The inn's history, well known in the area, 
is steeped in murder and deception. Captain John Stone built the inn in 1832. His patrons were young railway workers with little else to do except drink and gamble. This often led to violence, and legend has it that Stone himself killed the traveling salesman during a card game and buried his body in the basement. Stone and the salesman are said to be two of the spirits who have haunted the inn ever since. The inn has seen its share of tragedies, including the deaths of two people who were killed on the nearby railroad tracks, one a former manager and the other a little girl, both of whom are said to be haunting the inn. You know, instead of just calling them ghosts, I kind of, I feel like I understand them a little bit more. And I also understand that they're very dangerous. We used to take them very lightly because we didn't understand what they were before. And we had a lot of fun with them. But now I think of them in a more serious nature and that uh, they're, they really shouldn't be fooled with. They're very powerful and very dangerous things. Spiritualist Raphael Bibbo, intimately familiar with the inn's history and structure, feels that the sheer number of reports of poltergeists at the inn are enough evidence to conclude that paranormal activity is present. And with so many people who have had these uh, experiences, one cannot say that 75% of the public is paranoid or has some, got some problems with them because uh, there are a lot of credible people who have experienced, felt, seen, touched, and so you have to go on that basis that something must exist, something has to exist. Unlike the apparitions associated with hauntings, poltergeists are phenomena involving real-life physical activity. Is the building itself a source of these activities? The inn, uh, the thing that first caught me right off was that it's only about a 50 or 100 feet away from the, from the railroad tracks, and that's going to cause some pretty serious shaking of that building. Could the force of a passing train last long after the train has left, resulting in residual vibrations in the building? Could these have a significant impact on old walls and floors, resulting in unexpected sounds and movements? When there is movement between a beam and a post, for example, it will make a noise. Also, as it expands and contracts, the boards sitting on top of the uh, beams will creak, they'll make noises, they'll be noises like clunks and bangs and things like that that can easily be translated as footsteps. Local historians point out that there is nothing in their records indicating any kind of paranormal reports at the inn since it was built. Well, as you learn in stuff like this, there's so much hearsay. As far as the paranormal stuff, no, the, there are no written records in town of anything unusual, except possibly we look research where a young girl was killed by the train. That might be attributed to the ghost they talk about. Most of the people who visit or work at the inn are aware of its history of alleged hauntings and poltergeists. Are they simply misinterpreting a natural occurrence as a paranormal experience? When you do a magic trick, there, there, is one, there is the way the trick goes in real life, and then there is the way that the people remember it. So when they remember something, it's much better than it ever was when it was performed. And it's the same type of thing, I believe, with, uh, with sightings and paranormal activity like that. If you're, if you're in a receptive state of mind already to begin with, you will believe it. You will look for things that, and make connections that may or may not be there. Whether the poltergeists are real or not, one thing is certain. As long as the walls of John Stone's Inn stand, the stories will never die. Many experts on paranormal events agree that children and adolescents can be magnets for poltergeist activity. Are children lightning rods for the paranormal? Frank and Jackie Walker raised their daughters, Tara and Devin, in a farmhouse in the Oregon mountains. The Walker's home, nestled in Kings Valley, lies on property once owned by its namesake, Isaac King, who was found shot to death in his barn in 1866. And there are three stories. One, uh, the newspaper announced that he'd shot himself. Um, uh, but then another one said, well, no, it was an accident. And then the third one is that he was murdered by members of his family. 
No one knows. No one will ever know. Well-known local legend has it that King's ghost haunts the property on which the walkers now live. As soon as they moved in, Tara and Devon immediately felt they were not alone in their new home. They sensed something immediately when we moved in. I remember Tara and Devon, Tara first, telling me that she heard things. She heard footsteps. And I just said, well, it's an older house. We had a new home before, and this is an older home. And they, there are noises that are unexplainable sometimes in older homes. But she said, Mom, I think this, there's somebody here because I hear footsteps. Devon, seven years old at the time, told her parents that she also sensed an unknown presence. I just felt like someone was always watching me and like there. I just noticed that doors were shutting, no one was there, things were creaking in the hall. It was just kind of spooky and then all these other things started happening and I just felt that there was something there. Her older sister Tara observed several strange events that led her to believe she and her family were surrounded by spirits. And I guess the reason I believe in ghosts is because we moved here is because of all the strange happenings that have occurred. Doors slamming when no one's there, voices in the hallway when no one's there, footsteps when no one's there, stuff like that. Frank and Jackie dismissed these tales, concluding their daughters were anxious about their new surroundings. Then, one night, the parents experienced something unusual. During a dinner party, a guest uttered the word, ghost. The TV came on, the water faucet started up in the kitchen full blast, and the cat food container was dumped in the middle of the utility room floor. We talked about it later, Frank and I, and we decided that we'd better listen to our children. <laughs> the disruption seemed to be the work of an intelligent force with its own agenda. I remember my mom, she was getting mad at us because we were fighting over something, I can't remember what it was. We were fighting over the TV control or something. My mom said, go to your room. And when we went there, when I went there, the door was locked to my room. The hinges were inside the door. There's no way anybody else locked it. My dad wasn't home. The mischievous actions of the poltergeist seemed to reveal a prankish sense of humor. One day, Frank discovered that a critical document he needed for work was missing. The walkers searched the home and office frantically until it turned up in a very unlikely spot. It was stacked underneath two other boxes, and lo and behold, the report was on the top of that box, and none of us had taken it over there. The girls have their own separate drawing area, and there's no way they could have lifted the heavier boxes and inserted it. I had some angry words at that point. I asked the spirit to please leave us alone and stop hiding things. I actually just came out and said, whatever you are, please stop it. Frank's outburst appears to have transformed the poltergeist activity from mischievous to helpful. Suddenly, it was opening the gate at the farm's entrance for approaching cars and unlatching deadbolt locks on doors for Frank when he had forgotten his keys. And he asked my mom and my sister and me if we had opened it, and we said no. So we hope it's the ghost who answered it. We think it is. Still curious, Frank and Jackie called on ghost hunters Dave Esther and Sharon Gill. Dave and Sharon use an array of devices to collect evidence of the existence of ghosts. I believe in ghosts because I've seen them, I've heard them, they're real. You can measure, you can use physical instruments, scientific tests that can determine the mass, there's energy, presence, supernatural, it's not natural occurring. You can document it, measure it. Everybody thinks you need special equipment to do this, and that's absolutely not true. Um, you can even use Polaroid. I got a couple that had uh, different sort of swirls. Miss Jackie has gotten several like that as well. But that one particular day, behind her daughter standing in the office, there was a misty. It almost looked like it distorted the center of the picture. Dave and Sharon felt that the combination of photographic evidence, thermal readings, and the first-hand accounts were proof that a spirit was present. Because the idea of having a resident spirit was initially unsettling to the walkers, Dave and Sharon talked with them about their concerns. They felt very comfortable with us. Um, they started watching for things and, and noting things that were happening and realized that they were not 
malevolent in nature, they were being more protective than anything. Having spent years trying to quantify spirit activity and researching the history of paranormal outbursts, Dave and Sharon understand the potential connection between poltergeists and adolescents, something the girls find both comforting and exciting. According to the ghost hunters, at least I think that's what they said, is that kids can sense the entities better than grown-ups. Is there truly a relationship between poltergeist activity and adolescent children? A classic poltergeist is a, um, a center of um, funny physical happenings, particularly object movements and um, percussive sounds, you know, raps and whatnot. Um, the center being around an individual, often an adolescent, but not always. It wouldn't be without parallel for a rather isolated family with several children to develop poltergeist phenomena. Now, whether the emotional state triggers it off at the beginning in some way, and then when it happens, adds to it and feeds backwards and forwards, we don't know. But the emotional state is in the person who's seeing the things around which they are happening. I don't think it's got anything to do with spirits at all. Poltergeist researchers feel that the emotional turmoil of adolescence can generate enough psychic energy to trigger poltergeist activity. Psychologists argue that reports of poltergeists are simply people's misinterpretations of ambiguous situations. Possibly what is being taken as a poltergeist may indeed be a prank. In this case, where you have the little girls, it, it seems to me that that they started as a prank. They may even have started after that started to believe in it themselves. It's the kind of game that you play, and you keep on doing it, and you, you get to a point where you kind of forget how it all started, and it takes on a life of, of its own. And it doesn't seem unlikely that you might be able to convince your parents of the same. Phenomena that seems to be centered around adolescence seems to reflect adolescence itself. Here we have little prankster things happening, doors opening and closing. Objects that should be in one place are found in another. And we have to ask ourselves, is this really the action of a ghost or more of the action of the adolescent? Another explanation is more mundane. The plumbing is noisy. Old plumbing systems in particular, but plumbing systems in general, uh, can transmit voices. Uh, it is not unusual for people in single-family homes, for people in one home, to hear voices of their neighbors coming through a plumbing system. There is also a scientific explanation for the strange way the walker's gate at the farm's entrance occasionally opens when a car approaches it. As the wind tries to go around a solid body like a car or a building or something like that, the wind sort of piles up behind it, and as it tries to go around, it speeds up. So if you drive up to something like a gate, the wind coming around the car will speed up, and that can put more force on the gate and cause the gate to have the appearance of opening up uh, automatically. The walkers still believe they are at the center of paranormal activity, and the girls, for their part, strongly defend their beliefs. I would say, if you think I'm nuts, <laughs> then you can come over to our house and you'll think you're nuts too. Love, murder, and betrayal. Major themes in country music are also the key ingredients to an ongoing series of poltergeist reports at Bobby Mackey's Music World, a popular honky-tonk in Wilder, Kentucky, across the river from Cincinnati, Ohio. Country singer Bobby Mackey opened the club in 1978. His wife, Janet, pregnant at the time, was apprehensive about the move. When she first saw the building, she sensed a malevolent force. I was hesitant about even wanting a nightclub to begin with. But when I saw that door open by itself, I really, I, that freaked me out. But when we got inside, the lights kept coming on and off by herself, and uh, I could hear people talking. Shortly after the Mackeys began renovation of the club, Janet claims she was physically attacked by a ladder. And here comes this ladder. It was like somebody walking right toward me. And then when it got almost right directly toward me, in front of me, it started falling toward me. And then when it did, 
car grabbed me and jerked me off from the under, and it fell. And if I hadn't stopped and done what I'd done, got her out of the way, that ladder had marched up and actually tipped over by itself. I could not find an explanation for that. I know there was something evil here. In the 1930s, a woman named Johanna committed suicide here after the murder of her lover, a singer named Robert Randall. Local folklore held that she haunted the building, searching for her slain lover. Intrigued by all the reports of this evil presence, author Doug Hensley began researching the Mackey story and discovered information about club owner Bobby Mackey, linking him to the ghost of Johanna. When Bobby Mackey was born, his mother named him Randy Mackey, not Bobby Mackey, Randy Mackey. His baby book today so, still says Randy's baby book on it. She suddenly changed his name to Robert Randall Mackey. Janet Mackey was terrified that Johanna's ghost thought her husband was Robert Randall reincarnated and that Johanna could be jealous enough to do harm to Janet. While cleaning the upstairs apartment, Janet heard voices telling her to get out of the building, then felt invisible hands push her to the top of the stairs. So I struggled and pulled and struggled and pulled, and I got loose from it, got to the top of the steps, and I was at the top of the steps, I was pushed down them, and I grabbed the rail as much as I could going down, because I was, like I said, I was pregnant, protect myself, and I fell flat down on the bottom, looked up, and I saw some kind of a, an image. I couldn't tell if it was really a person or what it was. I couldn't tell. Carl Lawson used to reside in the upstairs apartment where Janet was allegedly attacked, and he has his own recollections of mysterious happenings during the time he lived there. We used to have a jukebox. We'd unplug it. And I can remember on occasion being upstairs on my sound of sleep, and this real old song, uh, Anniversary Waltz, would come on. And there's nobody in here. And I come downstairs to check everything out. The jukebox is unplugged, but I know what I heard upstairs. Anniversary Waltz. It was always that same song. Despite the disturbing ordeals reported by Janet and Carl, Bobby Mackey insisted that there were no such things as ghosts. I had every dime I had stuck into this place, and I had to make it work, and I didn't want any silly ghost stories going around, keeping people away from here. I wanted positive things, not negative things, and I was, uh, you know, country music is, is my life, and I don't want to hear about no ghosts. Just be quiet. Janet Mackey remained steadfast in her belief that something dangerous lurked in the shadows of Bobby Mackey's music world. When I was by myself, that's when I was really, really scared. But now, I can feel it in the air. I can feel her tension around me. I can feel her, you know, her vibes and stuff like that. I, I can tell she's around somewhere, and, and she doesn't want me around. Inspired by Janet's obsession with the ghost, every night, Bobby performs his biggest country hit, Johanna. Johanna is not the only ghost said to be haunting the club. One of Northern Kentucky's most notorious murders took place near the site. In 1896, two men, Alonzo Walling and Scott Jackson, killed Scott's pregnant girlfriend, Pearl Bryan. They allegedly buried Pearl's head in the basement well, perhaps hoping it would be washed out through the drain and into the nearby Licking River. Legend held that the ghosts of Alonzo, Scott, and Pearl could be heard walking and arguing throughout the club. Bobby Mackey's chief of security thinks he once heard one of their arguments while investigating a possible burglary with a fellow officer. Sensing voices coming from behind the stage, he moved in to see who was there. So the officer on the left Came, got up on stage, went through the door. I came to the right, went through the other door. We checked. There's no one behind that stage. Ever vigilant for reports of the ghosts, Larry was on duty at Mackey's one night when local resident Rich Lawson came to dance. The night Rich unexpectedly became part of the legend. 
so I was tightening my collar clips up to make sure they would not come off on the dance floor. And I was just humming and singing. I was just real hyper and real primed and ready to dance. And a garbage can right beside the wash basin was sitting there, and it took violently off and slammed right up against the petition wall of the commode. And I turned around real violently, you know, wondering who's gaming with me or what, what's going to happen. What Rich saw shocked him. There before him stood the image of a man dressed in clothes from the turn of the century, complete with handlebar mustache. He I never hit me, never punched me or nothing. But the bathroom was so hot, I was hot, just trying to gasp for breath, and I was going, trying to get out of this bathroom, and I made it to the hallway in the bathroom. And I just got so weak, and I, I went completely unconscious. Larry Hornsby heard the commotion and found Rich's near lifeless form on the floor. When Rich awoke, he was terrified. He said he seen a figure, and of a man wearing a big trench coat, like back in the old days, a mustache. When shown photos of Alonzo Wally, Rich recognized him as the man he had just seen. Even more frightening, he recognized the face of someone else in a photo of Alonzo and Scott's hanging. On the gallows in 1897, there's a judge and a preacher. I take my hat off, I resemble that preacher standing on the gallows holding the Bible. Though Rich continued to be haunted by his experience, and he is aware of some kind of danger at Bobby Mackey's, he refuses to back down. I got this feeling that the evil here wants me away. I'm intruding on them or something like that, and they're trying to push me away. I'm not going to leave, because I love country music, and Bobby Mackey's a great country music singer, and I'm a dance holly. I love to dance. While Rich thought he was a target of malicious intent, Larry Hornsby felt it was his destiny to help save Rich and the others at Bobby Mackey's from Alonzo's angry ghost. So what I think, what my theory is, he wants me out of here. He'll do anything possible to get me out of here. But like I said, he was evil, I'm good. And we're battling each other. Janet Mackey, however, was certain that strange occurrences at Bobby Mackey's Music World targeted her and her alone. I think it's a personal thing. I really do. Nothing's ever happened to Bobby. Nothing's ever happened to my children. It's just me. As far as family, you know. Other people, yeah. But I'm talking family. Nothing's happened to my girls. Nothing's happened to him. It's just happened to me. So therefore, I feel that they're just after me. The regulars at Bobby Mackey's all felt that they were part of a struggle between good and evil, and they turned to a psychic to confront the evil poltergeist. When confronted by poltergeist activity, most people feel helpless and misunderstood. For people at Bobby Mackey's Music World in Wilder, Kentucky, the battle had become intensely personal, and they turned to a psychic for help. I was born with psychic abilities and with the gift of healing. I have clairvoyance, which means that I can see visions or images, and I can hear spirit talking to me, which is clairaudience. Bodine claims to have established contact with four major ghosts, the two pregnant women, Johanna and Pearl Bryant, and Pearl's killers, Alonzo Walling and Scott Jackson. Echo's first visit was particularly unnerving for Janet Mackey. We were sitting in the casino room, which is now the bull room, and she looked at me and she goes, uh, I see Johanna behind you, and I thought I would die. I said, now, you got to be kidding me, right? No, she's standing right behind you. Three years after that terrifying first visit, Echo is still able to converse with the ghosts at Bobby Mackey's. We're going to go talk to Scott and Pearl, see if they'll go too. And even if they don't, I think you should just let Alonzo take you by the hand and take you over to the other side with him, okay? I'm standing right over there. Pearl, listen to me. Listen to me. 
Nope, she won't. Scott, can you listen? You guys do not have to stay here. No, you do not have to stay here. After these conversations, Echo is drawn to the basement well, which according to local legend, is a portal to hell. I can want to say there was weird things that happened in here to people, women. Not very good things. A lot of real crazy thinking. A lot of crazy behavior went on in here. I believe that's like a vortex. I believe whatever, whatever evil comes from here, it comes right out of there from right from hell. I believe that's an entry point. I believe if that well was dug up. We'll find a lot more, you know, evidence of a uh, polar guys type of activity. To... In an effort to relieve the worried minds of the Mackey owners and patrons, Echo tried to convince the ghost to leave. The psychic claimed that two, Johanna and Alonzo, said they were willing. Echo performed what she calls a cleansing, claiming to exercise the building of Johanna and Alonzo. I'll tell you what they are saying. Okay, Alonzo, yes. Do you still want to go to the other side? Yes. Okay, so you're really clear that you want out of here. Yes. Even though at least two ghosts remain behind, reports of poltergeist activity have diminished at Bobby Mackey's since Alonzo and Johanna departed. But their legacy still haunts the place if only in the plaintive chorus of Bobby's song. What do the people who report poltergeists at Bobby Mackey's have in common? It sounds as if there were three different personalities reacting to the same stimuli. They each had a different agenda, but, but they were all in, the, in a mental state to attract poltergeist activity. Most people do not realize how powerful their emotions are. And our emotions create energy fields around us all the time. I think that what is called poltergeist activity is most of the time spirits interacting with people on the earth. Psychologists note that people's emotions and perspectives can produce delusions, not demons. You have to look at the background of the people having these experiences. A security guard that has that responsibility is going to feel a personal obligation to rid a ghost or a poltergeist from the premises, it's his job. He's a security officer. It's not just the ghost is after anyone, but I have a link. I have a special uh, relationship with this ghost. And that just makes you look for more evidence of the same. It's almost acting like a delusion. Throughout this case, you have this notion that everyone is involved in this in, in an important way. So in a sense, it's, it, 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 it's a story about being, people asserting their, their self-importance. Even Echo Bodine acknowledges that poltergeist activity can be psychologically motivated. People need some attention, yeah. Oh yes, you can go into a home and people will say, oh, the ghost is doing this to me and this to me and this to me. And you walk around the house and there's absolutely no ghost there at all. But it's maybe her only way to get her husband's attention or the child's only way to get attention from their parents. Um, so what we do is we just say there is no ghost here. Another explanation for the supposed poltergeist activity could be the building itself. This building, though, is, is set up very nicely to hear sounds from a long distance away. The very large open pit in the basement opens into a drain under the railroad and over to the river. This drain provides a very nice path for sounds to come in, and it would be very possible for someone to be talking a long way away, maybe even miles away on a quiet day, have the sound reflect off something on the other side of the valley and be picked up like a microphone by this pipe and funneled into the building.
When a building such as the Mackey Club is constructed piecemeal over the years, its internal systems may be adversely affected. You could have lots of problems with the wiring that when you plug in something new, it spikes the whole system and you have a drop in the, in the lighting or the lighting will flicker. As for Bobby Mackey, all that matters to him is his music and the home he has created for it. To Bobby, stories of poltergeists at his club are just that, stories. I just can't believe that that, that happens. I just really don't believe that happens. Uh, I don't know if anybody can have that big of imagination or not, but there's got to be an explanation for it, other than the supernatural. Bobby Mackey may discount the supernatural outright, but others find themselves obsessed with finding out the true origin of these strange phenomena. The common links among reports of poltergeist activity are physical experiences involving motion, or kinetic energy. This makes them potentially quantifiable, which intrigues scientists like Barry Colvin. While working as a chemist for Shell Oil, Dr. Colvin's curiosity was piqued by reports of a local poltergeist. He discovered something that conventional science could not explain. Some years ago, um, a, a case was reported uh, near Leeds, which is in Yorkshire in the UK, and it sounded quite remarkable on the face of it. And this revolved around a hotel in which there were the parents and a son, and this son was the centre, it seemed, of some poltergeist activity. Upon arrival at the hotel, Colvin and other witnesses, including colleagues from Shell, were startled to see eggs floating through the hotel lobby. The egg actually traveled rather slowly. Uh, it was almost as though um, it was being held up. It was traveling, um, being held up by some unseen hand, if you like, um, traveling in a perfectly straight line, very slowly, and then smashing against the wall. So it was quite different to the, uh, the form that it would take if it was simply thrown from one side to the other. Colvin began exploring other reported poltergeist incidents. In a Yorkshire home, Colvin encountered strange rapping noises, which appeared to be efforts to communicate by a spirit called Eric. And it tapped out um, the messages by tapping the relevant number of letters through the alphabet. So for example, if it wanted to tap the letter M, it would be 13 taps and, and so on. Well, essentially what it tapped out was its name, first of all, which in itself is interesting because that then brings up the whole hypothesis of a spirit involved in, in, in these tapping sounds. It also tapped out the message that it was killed on this spot and that its body was still buried beneath the house. Though denied a permit to dig for the body, Dr. Colvin was nevertheless convinced there was a poltergeist because Eric's wrappings were strongly linked to the presence of one specific living person. We never, I think it's fair to say, we never had any activity at all from Eric when the girl was not present. Either Eric was a person and he is using the focus of this young girl to make himself known is one interpretation. The other interpretation would be that since the force is objective, and one cannot argue with that, that here we have a force which may be generated in the mind of possibly the girl, the mother, the two of them together, and simply they are generating a story of Eric for some unknown psychological reason. Colvin has just begun to scratch the surface, but to him, Science must clearly broaden its boundaries to describe physical forces that are now beyond its understanding. Psychologists Alan Gould and Tony Cornell agree that the witnesses, or as they call them, agents, have a strong role in the type of interaction with the poltergeist. I mean, one or two 
um, a poltergeist in which there have been communicative rappings and the raps have spelled out all sorts of messages as, as from uh, mysterious entities. Um, and they've actually made the same spelling mistakes that the um, person around whom the things center makes. So clearly the intelligence was the intelligence of the poltergeist agent. The complexity of the Eric case drew Dr. Colvin away from his work as a chemist at Shell to his new line of work, poltergeist research. There's an awful lot that can be done in terms of instrumentation. I am myself getting in very involved in modern, very up-to-date equipment, which I believe may well lead us uh, down the path to scientifically explaining what is going on. And I know that others working in other parts of the world are looking down this, this road of sophisticated instrumentation to determine something about the poltergeist force. Dr. Colvin founded the Poltergeist Research Institute, a group of international scientists whom yeah. he handpicked oh, to investigate way, poltergeist activity. Uh, never mind, I can come over straight away. All right, I'm on the way. Thanks. But being realistic, things generally occur one day and they could be gone in a week's time. And what we do generally these days is that in such a case, I have an aircraft and we simply, if we think it's worthwhile, we either get a local person to investigate and report back to us as soon as possible, or if it looks promising enough, we simply step into the plane and we go. And within generally an hour or two hours, we're there on the spot. Using a combination of scientific instrumentation, research, and a fine-tuned instinct, Dr. Colvin and the members of the Poltergeist Research Institute hope that one day, poltergeist forces will be as familiar to scientists as the wind, physics, even electricity. As some scientists keep looking for explanations for poltergeist activity, there remains a chasm between those who will only believe in empirical evidence and those like Raphael Bibbo, who believe there is more to our world than science can tell us. The spirits exist as well as we exist. It's interdimensional. They're here with us. And the, and the only way you're going to deal with it is just like if I'm talking to you, you talk to them. And yeah, you're going to have pranksters. You're going to have uh, people that can harm you. They can harm from that side as well as you can harm me. So it's just like a human being, except they don't have a physical body. And how can you account for fax machines or radio or television? You can have four or five televisions or radios in the same room and everything is coming in on a different channel and they're all pure, okay? How can you explain that and think that the mind is any less capable of these miracles? Others acknowledge that while we may never know the source of poltergeist energy, we should at least acknowledge its presence and try to understand its power. For years and years and years, investigators have heard these things happen. They know that certain people uh, have to be present for these things to happen. They happen around a particular person or a group of people. But I think we've got to concentrate on the person around which these things happen, if we're going to get the answer. If we're going to get the answer. So far, we've got nothing. In the end, the way we perceive poltergeists will ultimately be determined by how we use our own minds to perceive ourselves and our environment. The most powerful tool in misdirection is the spectator's mind. Because if the correct suggestions are given, their mind will take those suggestions and believe anything that is related to them. Paranormal experiences, including poltergeists, are a normal part of the human condition. They reflect who we are, they reflect our wishes, Sometimes those wishes aren't um, always positive. They don't reflect our beliefs, which aren't always positive. They reflect our relationships with other people. When we are all said and done, poltergeists are genuine experiences, but they're a psychological phenomena rather than a parapsychological one. Is it possible that we do not yet understand the capabilities of our own untapped energies? As psychics and scientists alike grapple with the mystery of poltergeists, the real answers may lie hidden in the recesses of the minds of those who have met them, and there they will remain unexplained.